Hello, and welcome to Barn Block. And today we're talking about the hermeneutics of suspicion associated with the three key kind of boogeymen of modern philosophy, your early, your late 19th, early 20th century trilogy of doom, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, and Friedrich Nietzsche, who the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur called the masters of suspicion. All right. And the reason why they were called the masters of suspicion, and he also called them the school of suspicion, is that the reading of society, culture, text, etc., that these three individuals did was the assumption that, <clears throat> that the straightforward appearances of text, of social structures, etc., were false. Now, I remember when I first learned about Paul Ricoeur, and I also um, got this from Hans George Gadamer. Um, when I was in a very basic literary theory class in a small college in Georgia, uh, where I went to my undergrad, and I remember being taught about the dominance of the hermeneutics of suspicion, which came out of, quote, the Industrial Revolution and became widely adopted after the, quote, terror of World War II. And I remember my professor telling me this as a just so story of how we got to modernism. You know, now that's an overly simple view of the hermeneutics of suspension. Gadamer goes so far as to basically take Ricoeur as stating that there are two kinds of hermeneutics. The hermeneutics of faith and the hermeneutics of suspicion. And while we have Ricoeur talking about, you know, the modernist trilogy, Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche, um, the German bad boys, so to speak, This really, this modality of reading really does actually go back to the textual critical critics um, of the early 19th century and the kind of um, liter um, literary and even more importantly, um, classical and biblical scholarship of the textual critical critics, many of whom were also philosophically attached to the young Hegelians, such as um, the Bauer brothers, who started reading the Bible, not at face value. All right. Um, and this kind of modality is often attributed with kind of introducing these ideas that you can't take the text, you know, you can't read it with a heuristic of charity or a heuristic of trust. And by the time you get to, to Freud, Marx, and Nietzsche, you have to start doubting that people are actually being honest in their own um, uses of consciousness and that you have to read little things into the text, either from the class perspective or the psychoanalytic perspective or the perspective of power, where self-deception and deception of others is kind of written into the whole. Now, this actually is part of the change of the meaning of ideology. Now, I way back uh, on the Zero Books channel, back when I worked for them, I did something on the history of ideology and its original use in the French liberal school as a positive term, which I know kind of blows people's minds, but that, that attack on French liberalism um, from the German schools where ideology kind of took on its negative meaning, um, which of course shows up in Marx, but not just in Marx. Marx wasn't the, the prime innovator there. But the reading of ideology extending to consciousness itself and that thus we couldn't trust text to tell us the truth. Like you can't take them as self-evidently. You can't read them. Uh, you can't necessarily read them charitably. Uh, that's that's kind of the way Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche 
worth according to Gadamer and Rakur. Now, the the text you want to read for this, um, is uh, hmm, Freud and philosophy, and you might also want to read. Um, interpretation on Freud. I'm not sure that that's been translated into English um, by Paul Ricoeur. You're also going to want to read um, Truth and Method by Gadamer, which really does go into this. The key things to take away, though, with the hermeneutics of suspicion, and we'll talk about how, like, it becomes a problem because it's very easy to use this in quote in the very loose sense of the term bad faith, not in the Sartrean sense, which is more specific, but you can start, you know, basically projecting arguments on the people by reading them suspiciously because you can pretend like, you know, their consciousness better than they do, which of course, you know, if you really take Freud seriously, neither you nor them really know their consciousness. Right. Um, but it does lead to a reading for an, you know, implicit biases, um, explicit hidden content, non-intended symbolic meaning, um, class prejudices, prejudice around distinction. And uh, Pierre Bardou picks this up. Um, the the way power is being contested in the use of language, the way sexuality is being contested in the use of language the way that consciousness becomes a, a a kind of rationalization and not a reason all right now um Rakur and gadamer contrast this with the hermeneutics of faith which we'll get into more um so what you get with the hermeneutics of suspicion you still have the hermeneutic loop, but now you're not using the text and the context to construct a positive meaning to understand what the author is saying. You're also using that loop to understand what the author isn't saying and maybe doesn't want you to know or what the author is hiding. And, and it's basically treating every text, every encounter, every structure even as a unreliable narration because consciousness itself is unreliable now the vector of which consciousness is distorted from this kind of reading of marx nietzsche and freud from Ricoeur and gadamer is different so for marx it's going to be the modes of production and the justification of the power relations in that mode of production not just power in itself for Nietzsche, it's power qua power, the ability to force, which is beyond the mode of production, but also in things like mimetic rivalry. Um, Nietzsche has a very Thucydidean or Hobbesian view of people's attempts at power. But unlike Hobbes, he doesn't think a sovereign's going to fix it. Only the only through struggle and through being ruthlessly self-honest about your your attempts to take power, shifting from slave morality, which is dishonest, but innovative and quite intelligent. In fact, there's almost a historical dialectic in Nietzsche. Um, Nietzsche's not that systemic, but where you have the kind of blonde beast, the lion, um, the, the brute aristocrat who is outsmarted by, you know, the, uh, the peoples he's subjugated in the slave, but then through that becomes more intelligent and more overcoming, but can be more honest. Like this is from the master and slave back to, to the overmen morality, right? Um, that's Nietzsche's hermeneutic of suspicion. That's what he thinks going on. Freud, you know, there's all this repressed sexuality and there's very specific ways and the, the various theories of the Oedipus complex and the, the, the layers of consciousness fighting with each other. Um, the superego, the ego, and the id being at odds. And then, of course, Marx, you have 
the ideology of the ruling classes uh, setting up various forms of uh, fetishization, reification, um, distortions of belief, which justify class rule, right? So you have three different modes of suspicion there, but they are the school of suspicion, according to Gadamer and Ricoeur, and you can see how these play out. Um, so if you've heard the term the hermeneutic of suspicion, that is what it refers to. But in the next episode, we'll talk about the hermeneutics of faith. Thank you.